Hi everyone, and welcome back to another episode here at Catholic Tea with Talk Podcast. This is the podcast where everything Catholic is on the table. Um, thank you again for joining us on another episode here at the table. If you are new to the show, or if you're not, but please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and rate the show wherever you listen to the show. If you don't know where to listen to the show besides the platform you are listening to, look down in the description box below. And we have all of our links right there in handy to help you guide you to all of our channels, as well as a web page. So uh, check out the links below in the description. As well as thank you for um, Dr. Katrina Wynn for sponsoring today's show. Uh, she's a Catholic physician, author, speaker, and nonprofit founder. To learn more about how she can help you, your family, and your community out by visiting her website at mdkatrina.com. Uh, thank you for Dr. Wynn for. Uh, spots on today's show. If you want to be a spot of the show or donate towards the show or all your uh, great, great motion dice um, or anything else, please email us at catholictt at gmail.com. Catholictt at gmail.com is the official email of Catholic Table Talk. So um, with that being said, uh, we have a guest on today. He has been on the show the most out of anyone who has been on the show. This is his fifth time on the show. Um, his most recent episode was episode 57. Um, that was my abortion series I did. Um, right before we will be waiting, got over to one. Um, is abortion killing a human being? Um, and like I said, he's been this is his fifth time on. My favorite one with him was in episode 41. Uh, we talked about the managed doom of the Catholic Church, and today we're going to talk about the two creeds that we have about the church. Now, we all might know different kinds of creeds. Um, like me, for example, I know of the FFA creed. I don't know it because I didn't ever really have to really say it too much, but I know of it. I know about it. Um, and the same thing with the two creeds that we say in church. We know them probably by heart in church, but maybe we don't know them by heart outside of church and then the history of them. So, uh, Ken Lichfield is dropping by again to uh, talk about the two queens of the church. So, uh, so welcome back on. So, Ken, thank you for coming back on the show. Hi, William. Thanks for having me back. Um, and really enjoy doing your show. <laughs> I didn't know that I was the number one, you know, guest for you, <laughs> but, but it is an honor. Yeah, and, well, yeah, it's an honor. And thank you just for your continuing support of the show, Ken, and willingness to come back on. And uh, so, yeah, let's just uh, dive right into them. Um, I asked you, and do you have any topics? And you said, yeah, let's do the, the queens. Um, so kind of what are the queens? And then just kind of a brief uh, history of them. Because like I said, we probably know them by heart in church. But outside of church, we don't really know much about them. Right. So most of us Catholics are familiar with the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. But uh, there's a fair bit of history behind them. And once you kind of dig into it, you know, they can mean a lot more to you. Um, so like the very first creed of the church that we have a record record of is in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verses 1 through 11. And it says there, I'll just read it here because it's not that long. Now, I am reminding you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you indeed received and in which you also stand, though it may, through it, you are also being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believe in vain, that he, Jesus, appeared to Cephas, Peter, then the 12 apostles. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers at once, most of which whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep, that has died. After that, he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as one born abnormally, he appeared to me. Paul's referring to himself there. For I am the least of the apostles, not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God, 
but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me has not been ineffective. Indeed, I have toiled harder than all of them. Not I, however, but the grace of God that is with me. Therefore, whether it be I or they, so we preach, and so you have believed. So Paul writes this to the Corinthians, and it's, you know, later on in his first letter to them. But it gives us an account of um, what the mission of the apostles is and how Jesus really did rise from the dead and appeared to many people, like over 500 people, not just the apostles. So this isn't just a story that they made up. It's something known to many people. And he says, you don't have to believe me. You can go ask them. They'll tell you. You saw Jesus after he was crucified. So um, this is the earliest recording we have in the Bible. Um, now, the Apostles' Creed is, let's see, there is like a story about the Apostles' Creed in that um, because there's like roughly 12 lines to the Apostles' Creed that one of each of the 12 apostles contributed to the Apostles' Creed. Um, so I'll just read that here. Uh, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. So that's a creed that we're pretty much familiar with. Uh, that may be the creed that is said in between the homily and the Eucharistic liturgy or the uh, petitions at your church. Um, because the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed are uh, two creeds that can be um, proclaimed at that time during Mass. Um, now, after the Apostles' Creed was developed, there was a creed called the Athanasius, Athanasian Creed, um, and it was developed by Bishop Athanasius of Alexandria. Um, it's fairly long. I won't read the whole thing, but here's a key line from it. Uh, the Holy Ghost is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. Um, now, in the Catholic version of the Nicene Creed, there is a line that says, And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who together with the Father and the Son is to be adored and glorified who has spoken through the prophets. And that line, and the son, was added to the Nicene Creed that we proclaim at Mass um, in the late 500s. And we'll get into why it was added in there. But Athanasius, the Bishop of Alexandria, you know, was already proclaiming that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. So it's not something that, it was not a new concept added to the creed later on. It was added for clarification. And we'll get into that a little bit later on. Right. Okay. Well, awesome. Um, most of that was even new, more newer to me. Um, now, like I hear the Apostles' Creed a lot, like, I mean, if you say the rosary, if you say the last mercy chaplet, um, you say, um, you say the Apostles' Creed in there. Um, I like to say either one, um, can be in between the petitions, um, or in the homily. Um, so what, I mean, they sound, they, they kind of sound identical. I mean, they are not, but for maybe other people, other, um, non Catholics, maybe they do. Um, so, why are the two of them the same? And then, 
you know, if, I mean, there's enough, but uh, why are not the same? Right. The reason that there's, we have two of them and they're similar, but not exactly the same, is that the Apostles' Creed was the creed that when you were becoming a Christian, um, that was the creed that you proclaimed or that you learned in your local Christian church. Um, and it was kind of referred to as the baptismal creed. When you became a Christian and got baptized, that was the creed you recited. And all the major churches around Christianity, which was like all around the Mediterranean, um, they had similar creeds. You know, there were slight variations, but they were uh, basically the same messages. Um, now, the oldest copy that we still have today is the baptismal creed of Rome. And the oldest copy we have of that still today is from 390 AD. And actually the form of the Nicene Creed that we have now was actually already written by then. Um, but that's just, you know, the written copy that we have. It's not like it was made up in 390 AD. A lot of people think that, you know, well, if this is the oldest one that we actually have, you know, then it was invented then. It's like, no. <laughs> Right. It was written about earlier right. than that, um, and there might be, you know, quotes of it, you know, in many from many early church fathers of the creed. Um, so we know that it existed earlier. We just don't have a complete written copy of it. And when you consider these documents, you know, would be like two thousand years old. You know, you can understand why we don't still have that. Um, we have books that are a hundred years old and you know falling apart. So. Why would we expect a two thousand year old document to still be there around? No, uh, uh, yeah, that's pretty valid. I mean, like, and, I mean, yeah, we, go ahead. Okay, so the reason there's a difference is like the Apostles' Creed is like the baptismal creed, the creed you would say when you get baptized, but the Nicene Creed um, was a creed that was established to combat heresy that was in the church at the time. And we'll get into that a little bit on the next question. Awesome. Okay. Um, now, when I was doing these questions, um, so thank you for doing a good job answering that, Ken, because I probably could have went in the question a little bit better there. Um, but yeah, so like the Nicene Queen, um, like the name of it, it's... I mean, like I said, we, we say every, or we can say every mass um, at mass. Uh, and basically to me, when I think of it, I think of it as someone walks up to you and maybe you told me this or you even sure told me this, but someone walks up to you and says, what do you Catholics, what do you Catholics believe in? And you basically tell them the Nicene Creed. Um, so was the Nicene Creed finished? after the Council of Nicene? Oh, great question. Well, <laughs> and the answer is no, it was not finished. You know, what we have today is the Nicene Creed was not finished at the Council of Nicaea in 325. Um, so we have to think about the, uh, what was going on at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Uh, um, most of Christianity at that time held to a view of Jesus that was proposed by a bishop named Arius. And Arius taught that there was a time that Jesus was not. Like there was first, you know, God the Father, and then God the Father um, created Jesus. And then everything was created through Jesus. Um, so when somebody refers to like an Arian heresy or an Ar Arianism, He's, that person is referring to what Bishop Harry Arius taught. Um, and like all bishops, you know, he started out as a priest. Um, and at the Council of Nicaea, you know, most of the bishops there agreed with Arius's interpretation of what was known as the scriptures at that time and held to this idea that, you know, first there was God the Father, 
and then he created God the Son. Um, and they had a slogan at that time that was goes like this. There, there was a time when the Son was not. So there was a time when Jesus didn't exist. Now, if we look in the Bible, John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And Jesus is the Word incarnate. So what John is trying to hammer home there is that Jesus existed from the beginning. Um, let's see. So now let me just read you the Nicene Creed, and you know we can get an idea on how it is so different. So this is the Nicene Creed from the Council of Nicaea. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, only begotten from the Father, that is, from the same substance of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one substance with the Father, through whom all things came into, be into being, things in heaven and things on earth, who because of us men and because of our salvation came down and became incarnate and became man and suffered and rose again on the third day and ascended into the heavens. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. And we believe in the Holy Spirit. And that was it. But then there was a, a postscript at the end that said, but for those who say there was a time when he was not, and before being born, he was not, and that he came into existence out of nothing, or who assert that God's son is of a different hypostasis or substance, or created, or is subject to alteration or change, these the Catholic and Apostolic Church anathematizes. So those people that believe those heretical things, the Catholic Church says, you are not of our church. You are out of our church. So the bishops after the Council of Nicaea, they took home this Nicene Creed and had to sell it to the people in their congregations and their diocese. And since a lot of people held to this idea that Arius had that, you know, Jesus was created at some point in time by God, you know, it was tough for them. So later on in, uh, well, I'll, go, I'll stop there and see if you have any comments, questions. No, I, I might be getting my head in my, uh, uh, excuse me, I might be getting ahead of us if I ask any questions. So um, I'll let you keep going and then I'll do it at the end. Okay, so in 381 AD, they had another council in Constantinople this time because the city had been finished. And this is where the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed was developed. And we now call it the Nicene Creed because that's a whole lot easier than Nicene, Niceno Constantinopolitan Constantinopolitan just, just, just little... Creed. <laughs> See, I have a hard time with that. <laughs> um, okay. So, right. So the creed that we have now as the Nicene Creed um, was finished at three eight in the three eighty one, um, but around six hundred A.D. That's when the the Latin churches in the East or in the West, yeah, um, added the word and the sun. And the reason that and the sun was added to the, the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the sun was added because even though the Nicene Creed finished in 381 was established, um, the church in Constantinople had been sending out missionaries um, to go out and spread Christianity. And so they spread from Constantinople, which is in what we now call Turkey, um, in, into the northern parts of Europe. 
And because they had been trained in Constantinople where Arianism was still, you know, kind of hiding there in the background, the version of Christianity they taught to the uh, pagan tribes in Northern and Eastern Europe, particularly, um, they were taught an Arian version of Christianity. So that's why in 590 AD, the Pope at that time um, standardized the idea of adding and the Son so that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Um, for us Catholics, you know, we think of God the Father and God the Son, and then the Holy Spirit proceeding from both of them. Now, in um, Orthodox Christianity, they think of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit proceeding, you know, from the Father alone. And that is a point of contention between us Western Catholic Christians and the Eastern Orthodox Christians. Um, and the Eastern Catholic Christians, you know, they don't have a problem with the and the son in the creed. Uh, and it is theologically sound, but because in 590 AD, the Bishop of Rome, um, this was after the fall of the city of Rome, and like the whole Western part of Christianity was considered, you know, kind of like the wild west of Christianity. It was not very... Um, civilized and organized and the eastern christians you know thought of the western christians as um well like the wild west you know the people of boston and new york and philadelphia would have considered the people west of the mississippi in american history you know like the wild west out there were you know they just do what they want and you know there's a lot of killing going on and it's a wild country, and they don't necessarily get things right out there. But the main reason for adding and the sun was to fight this Arianism that was taught to the pagans in northern and eastern Europe. Oh, I do have a question here, Ken, um, and this is probably a little bit on the fly here, but because um, it started out, like we said, it was 325, um, and then it was um, the Pope changed in 590. I mean, that's a solid point that you made about the Arianism, because most people are like, why do we, why do we, uh, why do stuff changes? Like, why do we say the Queen's different than, we, than it was way back when? Um, and that's a good point to make, and everyone should know about that. Um, but has, do you know of, has the queen changed really since then? And then just kind of like the reasons before, behind changes, because people might say, like I said, it seems like the queen kind of keeps changing throughout the years. Like, and like you said, it's Arianism and all that, explaining that. But, you know, like, why do we have to say it differently more today? Um, I can, I can kind of see a lot of people saying that. So, um, I mean, what, what would you say to that? Very good question. Okay. So the main reason the church um, has held councils is when there is a dispute on, you know, doctrine in the church. Um, and then they have to like hammer out, you know, well, what is what the church actually teaches? And if you read the Council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15, you know, you find out, you know, the people were yakking back and forth, you know, no, oh, this, this. Oh, no, no, no. you got to keep the Jewish law. No, you don't got to keep the Jewish law. And they were fighting back and forth. It wasn't like they were just sitting around looking in the Bible. It's like, well, the Bible says we need to do this because the New Testament was still being written at that time. And the, what they had is the Bible at that time was the Old Testament. And the Old Testament says, yeah, you got to be circumcised. And no, you can't eat those foods. <laughs> so right. if they wanted to go right. by scripture alone at the Council of Jerusalem, they would have, you know, we'd still all have to be circumcised by 
of Moyo, not just uh, you know the obstetrician that delivered you, um, and we would have to not be eating shellfish and uh, pork, you know. So no more bacon, <laughs> no more ham. <laughs> That'd be a rough life. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the Cree um, councils are held to hammer out. Um, difficulties in the church and so the council of nicaea was held because there were so many people believing in an Aryan version of christianity and so they hammered out no jesus is co-eternal with the father god from god light from light one god okay. and but because the Council of Nicaea didn't really define the Holy Spirit, you know, that had to be hammered out at the Council of Constantinople. And that's how we get the ending part of what we now call the Nicene Creed. And I'll read that now so that we can, you know, understand the, know the big picture. So this is the Nicene Creed, you know, fully developed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, and born of the Father before all ages, God of God, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, by whom all things were made for us men and for our salvation, came down from heaven, and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit, and the Virgin Mary, and was made man, was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate, suffered and was buried, and on the third day rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and shall come again in glory, to come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, of whose kingdom there shall be no end, and in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who together with the Father and the Son is to be adored and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We confess one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So, the Nicene Creed, as we know it today, you know, developed our understanding of how the Holy Spirit fits in with the Trinity. Uh, the original Nicene Creed from 325, you know, recognized that there is a Holy Spirit, but the Niceno Constantinopolitan Creed uh, lets us know that the Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity, another person in the Trinity so that we know that the Holy Spirit is also fully God, just like Jesus and just like God the Father. And thank you for clarifying that with the with the councils and the Nicene Creed because yeah, it's we are kind of I mean divide among that. And people are like, you keep adding stuff to it, you know, you have all these councils just changing the law of the church is like no, we're just trying to help explain it better um, in that way. So uh, thank you for that. Um, we only have a few more minutes, Ken, so try to get to the next couple of questions really quickly here. Um, and I guess we can kind of view this next question as more kind of a personal too. Um, like I said, I I might want to say the nice thing Creed every day um, and explain it the way you did um, just because that's what Catholics believe in. Um, so, well, why is why should we say it every day? Um, well, it's in church or if it's outside of church. Right. The um, Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed, you know, remind us of what we believe. Um, and we're taught to memorize them at an early age. But yeah. if you actually, you know, reflect on them as you are saying them, you know, think about what you're saying and what it actually means in your life and in the life of the church. 
and it'll take on a whole new meaning for you. And, you know, you should think about that, you know, when you're saying it is, okay, this is what I have subscribed to. This is what I am bound to. This is how I have to live my life. So it'll mean a lot more to you then. Gotcha. All right. Thank you for that. Um, so just wrapping up uh, the uh, episode here, Ken, um, any last thoughts on the Queens? Um, has, I guess, any people really talked to you much in detail about them? And then just kind of, as the last thoughts and anything new happening with you? Right. Um, let's see. Well, one other little point um, in the revision of the mass under Pope John Paul II, um, the original translation of the Nicene Creed from Latin into English um, did not include the word consubstantial. It said, you know, like basically the same substance, something like that. Um, or anyway, the word consubstantial means that, you know, Jesus and God the Father are the same substance, consubstantial. Um, whereas the old verbiage, you know, could be interpreted as like like substance. Um, so like you could say like Jesus is like the, is the mirror image of God the Father. But no, Jesus is not the mirror image of God the Father. He's the same as God the Father. And uh, let's see. So as far as what's new with me, uh, I've been doing some more shows with Gary Mashuda. So uh, if you're a regular listener to Hands On Apologetics, you might hear me on there. Um, and I continue to, you know, do apologetics work on Facebook um, and help spread the truth of the Catholic faith. And uh, also my Knights of Columbus Council that I'm very involved with, you know, we're going like gangbusters. We uh, do a lot of things and uh, I'm helping to create a, uh, a flyer for our church bulletin, you know, to help with recruitment. Um, it's hard to find, you know, that just that right mix between, you know, information on why guys should join and not tell them, you know, so much stuff is like, well, I'm not going to read all this stuff, you know? Right. So yeah. there's a million reasons, to, million reasons to join the Knights of Columbus, and I encourage every man out there to join. Um, and just like, you know, every church is not exactly the same. Uh, every Knights of Columbus council is not exactly the same, but if you get into a council that is, you know, pretty, uh, uh, not doing much, you know, then you have a chance to step up and make that council more involved and do more. Our, our council, we got a lot going on. <laughs> and, well, it's hard to keep up at our meetings. Oh yeah. I bet. I bet. Well, uh, Thank you for being a night, Ken. Um, I appreciate all the work that they do, and I hopefully, too, will join in the future real soon. Um, and just thank you again for just your ministry that you do. Um, like you said, you're on Game of Truth a lot, and just coming on the show so many times and just helping me out um, on and off the show. Um, I just really appreciate that. And um, don't forget, folks, also, here is Ken's book, uh, How Is Your Church? Um, he has watched of the show, so I thought I'd throw that in there for you for free there, Ken. Um, so thank you for that, and uh, yeah, welcome back anytime, even if I don't say come on, if you come back on, you're welcome to say, I want to come back on, Bill, get me back on, so <laughs> we'll get you on, right? Well, since I've been on you know more times than anybody else, I don't want to hog all, the, all your time slots, um, so I won't bug you too much. Uh, but I'm always glad to be on. Uh, if anybody has any questions, you can email me at kenlitchfield61 at gmail.com, or you can look me up on Facebook. And you can get my book at Amazon. It's only $6, so it's not going to break the bank. Uh, I suggest you always get two because it's going to cost you more for the shipping than the book. That's true. That is true. And it's only 100 pages, so it's a very easy to read. Um, really readable and I enjoy it. And plus it has a history of the whole of every church in it. So that's that that's like my favorite page. But right. <laughs> uh, so, all right. So uh I'll 
provide your links down in the description box below, like I always do, Ken. And uh, we'll uh, hopefully talk soon. All right. Thanks for having me, William. Really enjoyed being on the show with you. All right, everyone, that's Ken Litchfield. So go check out his links in the description box below. And his other four previous episodes that we have had him on are great episodes. Um, and like I said, they range from how old is your church to um, the magisterium to abortion to now the apostle and the Nicene Creed. So uh, go check out all his episodes and our episodes on our channels. Thank you again, everyone. Go to the sacraments. Stay in stay grace. Uh, pray. And God willing, we'll see you the same time next week on Catholic Table Talk podcast, the podcast where I think Catholic is on the table.